you're not going to be better until you start to challenge yourself to be better not to be what comes easy not to be what you've practiced 10 20 years in doing and you know you're good at it but what am i not good at it's the question again <laughs> let me go into this storm and figure that out that's how you grow welcome to this week's escape your limits podcast today we're speaking with a prominent celebrity personal trainer who became widely known for his role as the main trainer on the american version of the biggest loser In this moving and inspirational talk, he shares his hard-earned insights about the mental demands most trainers overlook when it comes to helping people achieve their fitness goals and life ambitions. In our interview, we discussed why you'll never really succeed until you improve your relationship with yourself, the real truth about training A-list celebrities, the importance of self-love, and how to find purpose in the present moment. So if you're in search of motivational principles and strategies to enhance performance and become the best version of yourself, then this episode is for you. So please welcome Mr. Dolvit Quince to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Dolvit, thank you so much for joining us on today's Escape Your Limits podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. We're just saying you're a bit of an expert. How long have you had your podcast going? not long at all. The idea I've had for many years, the execution has only been a few months, but I've been very fortunate and I I put my mind to anything. I work really hard. I interview about four, maybe five interviews every Tuesday and then I drop them every Tuesday as well. Wow. You do four or five a week. Four or five in in one day. In one day. Wow. That's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like I, I'm so busy doing other things. I'm like, you know, pile it on. I just I want to chat with people. I want to get to know them and hear their stories and uh Tuesdays just happen to be a free day, uh, but I made yeah. it a busy day. Go figure. Right. So, how's it? What's it like being on television? Because you've been doing that for quite a while. Is that something? Is that a skill that you've had to really kind of develop and master in terms of how to be good on camera and present and work with people, or are you just naturally gifted in that area? The honest answer, I think, it's a combination of both. I think you you have a certain talent, as we all have certain talents we're born with. But I think refinement comes from practice. You know, I remember being a kid and doing plays and feeling very comfortable doing a play. Um, but I also felt as if uh, the more I remember my first audition and doing a major commercial, I was so green on the set, thinking, "Oh, what do I do?" And um, I just was calm. I calmed down. I was myself, and then uh, I, I did. I did it. And I, luckily enough, I kept getting called back to do more. So I must have been doing something right. Yeah, that's right. I've I've watched a number of your interviews, and they're they're very interesting. I think the recent one I watched when you was with Tom Billier, and you yeah. used the word reasonably frequently. You used the word evolution, and you talk about that quite a bit. And and I I just wondered sort of how why. Why has that been important to delve it, and how have you used that both in life and business? Um, you know, I, I like to say to be a student is as important to being a teacher. I never want to walk in the room having all the answers. And part of my evolution has has been I know what I know, but I also know enough to know that I really don't know shit. Right? I literally have to just be open and willing to learn. Right. And I think part of my evolution is that another part of my evolution, uh, where I'm living in now, is the space of uh, mental health, and understanding that that is a huge component to health. I think oftentimes in my space, as a trainer, as someone who helps guide someone to their highest potential physically, we lean so we we lean so heavy into that space, right? Mm -hmm. Let me sculpt your arms. Let me give you the best abs of steel. Let me put you know. We think from that lens. But over the years, having have done this so long, I realized that there was more weight on the brain than there is on the body. So let me help someone really love themselves, practice here, and now my evolution has taken me there. I'm, I'm a self development coach. I actually have a few certifications in the space of mental health, uh, um, and I've, I've ev evolutionally switched my career that way. Right. How do you define health? Because it, it's an, I, and I know I've read and watched some of this stuff, so I kind of half know where you're going with it. But I think it'd be useful for the listeners to to get your perspective because you've influenced millions of people, both on television and through your books, and 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 dealt and helped people to sort of overcome those challenges. So I'm just curious how you today will will define that. 
Today, I would define it as self-love. To me, that is health. That's the epitome of health. I, I, I gave, I just spoke to a, a group down in South Beach a few days ago, and I said, it doesn't matter how you look, that doesn't define how healthy you are. It's truly a matter about how you feel and your perception. There was a young woman when I first moved here to Los Angeles, her body was phenomenal. She managed the gym that I worked out in. A couple of weeks passed and she passed away. She committed suicide. So it wasn't just about how she looked, she didn't love herself within. So the win in health to me, is a proper mindset. It's also the physical part of how you take care of yourself. It's the part about how you eat, how you rest, how you recover. Are your laughs more frequent than your woes, more your pain? If you know, to me, healthy is just that. There's so many pieces of it. There's five specific pieces to me, uh, mental, physical, emotional, uh, uh, Social is another one, and I forget the fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> I know on your your um, your uh, in, uh, is it link, yeah LinkedIn page you you you're defined as as an expertise in or an expert in in self love. So how do you how do you actually love yourself? That's a great question. Um, you you <coughs> love you love yourself by accepting your flaws. You love yourself by counting how grateful you are with what you have. You love yourself by giving yourself to others, being there for advice, uh, no expectations. You love yourself by simply taking care of yourself in ways that you probably weren't taught to take care of yourself, but you have earned through other experiences. You love yourself by becoming a good listener because the more you practice listening, the more you practice things to do. Um, yeah, that's, that's just a piece of it. But that's, that's what I feel self love is. Are there any pros and cons or can I, I suppose on one extreme, you you can see people that sort of maybe love themselves. I won't say love yourselves too much. But mm -hmm. you've, you've, you hear the term of oh, they're, they're in love with themselves. And that, you know, maybe more of a an ego side, and maybe maybe that really uncovers an actual, you know, somebody who doesn't really love themselves. I don't know. Yeah, but are, yeah. there, are there any? <laughs> have you seen that there's sort of pros and cons, and and also how to get that sort of real balance where, you know, it's 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 real love, and you it, it's it's working for you as opposed to creating other problems down the road down the road. Well, I don't think you should get it misconstrued. I don't think self-love means you're the only person you practice that on. Loving yourself means you use yourself as the guinea pig to give away, right? Anyone who's self-indulgent, narcissistic, they truly don't love themselves. They're actually trying to fill a void of the lack of love that they have for themselves. So they present a certain facade in front of their truth. Someone who loves themselves can be self-deprecating, but at the same time, extremely confident. They know exactly who they are, right? And that, that confidence doesn't come across as arrogance. It comes across as confidence because your intention isn't to, by the way, I love myself so much, you should also get up here and love me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, I don't think that that's somewhere where someone, or at least what I practice and I help others practice. It's more so I love myself enough to take care of myself. I love myself enough to do right by me and the world around me. I love myself enough to take care of my family and my work, right? So the act of love, the highest piece in acting of love is practicing how to give it back or give it away. Hmm, interesting. With When I was reading about this subject and listening to you talk about it, it, it kind of got me to think about some of the conversations I've had with people about um, about their value and and how um, how they perceive the value that that they have within themselves, or or I don't know if it's another way of, of using the word value, but but where people don't appreciate the value that they bring or have to themselves and and devalue themselves in some way. So how do you work with people that probably do not know their value? They don't know that they don't know their value. If if, if that makes sense. That makes you. sense. Did, did, that makes perfect sense. Um, I think what happens a lot, Matthew, when people don't know their value, they simply are 
their mind isn't on the right things. Their mind tends to practice more with what they don't have than what they do have. You know, they, they are in the art of pursuing, I need more things because they have more things. I need more talent because they have more talent. I need more followers because they have more followers. So they're always in the, in the paralysis of comparison. Someone who has value is spending time, first and foremost, appreciating what they have. You ever work so hard to a goal for a goal that you forget about the goal once you reach it because you're busy thinking of the next goal, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, quite frequently. So, <laughs> right, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a behavior that is simply not beneficial to us just as human beings. Listen, there's no timeline promised to us on this planet in this life. So why not take a moment and appreciate who you are, where you are, and what you've done thus far? Who I am at this stage in life, that guy had to work so hard to get here. Although I know I have so much more to do that I still haven't even done yet. I'm not blinded by the pursuit without giving what I've done its proper respect. And so I wake up every morning being grateful. I literally practice out loud gratitude. Wow. I'm so blessed. I get to wake up to this next to this beautiful woman. My son is amazing. Look at this house that I have. You know, look at these clothes. You know, I remember yes conversation. That was amazing. I needed that. And so I really lean into what was to, a, to and give light to it within the is, meaning that it's is right now. And I'm appreciating it. And that gives me fuel to go after the things that I want. That creates value. That creates value. And does that link into being in the moment? You've used, in, in the language you use, you use the word moments and um, sort of loving what you, you're doing almost like in this present moment. Does that, can, does that tie into what you're saying as well? You, like you mentioned about going after a goal and looking for the next one. And I, I suppose using some of the terminology that you use about moments, do you, do you think sometimes that we, we're not necessarily in that moment moment um living somewhere else and and that causes us to, to sort of not recognize that as well what, what's your experience around that a thousand percent i th i think the moment doesn't get the love it deserves right the yeah. moment doesn't right have you ever been on vacation and been on your phone right yeah. <laughs> have you ever i've ever, got better at it as i've been older have you, certainly. right but it's you know but you know i say that but you're as driven, as successful as you are because you took those moments to keep going anyway. I respect that. Don't get me wrong. However, the moment still doesn't get the love it deserves. Let's say for, for you're, you're on the beach, you're with your family, right? Your daughters are out playing in the sand. Your wife is reading a good book. You're working away. You might say something like, can you believe this shit? You're on vacation. You're supposed to be relaxing, but mentally you're not giving the moment the love it deserves. Do that come off of that. Don't live in that moment. You, you handled your business. It's great. Okay, fine. Now put that shit away. I'll tell you a quick story. I remember going on a vacation with a friend of mine. He asked me, he was actually in the middle of starting a divorce. And he said to me, you know what? I booked this yacht, wife and I, and the whole thing, obviously now with a split and I still have it. Would you mind escorting me on this trip? We'll bring a couple of friends or what have you. I'll say, great, let's do it. So go down to the Bahamas. We go to a boat. We're visiting the various islands. And I remember getting up out of bed. I was the first to wake up and I looked out in the ocean and it was just gorgeous. The sun was just coming up and I grabbed, I had my phone with me and I grabbed it and I went to go take an Instagram story. Oh my God, this is amazing. I got to share this with people. And I, and my, and the Wi-Fi wouldn't work, Matthew. I'm like, what the hell? It was so, and I remember just like looking at my phone and just what the hell was wrong? And I have the conversation on my phone. As I'm mad at the phone and it's not doing what I needed to do, I looked up. This fish jumped out the water. And I, was, and I realized in that moment, I'm looking down. I'm literally looking down when I should be looking up, when I should be focused and appreciative of the moment. It doesn't matter that I'm not sharing this moment if I'm not truly enjoying what the moment is giving me. It's exactly what I needed to live in that moment. And that taught me a big lesson. Be present on purpose. Is that a conscious practice that or habit that you create or, or develop within your life now? It, it is now. 
because I'm like you. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm 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 I, I'm a go getter. I'm a capitalist. I, I I love things and I love to be able to go on trips with my family. And I realize that takes a certain dedication when you don't have to punch a time clock. I realize that you're always. So I respect all of it. So I truly have to practice on purpose. It's like working out. There's days you don't want to work out, but you go anyway and you're grateful that you did. It's the same thing I have to do with that mental part of it. Dalvet, be present. Dalvet, appreciate this moment. Put your phone away. Have a conversation with her. Sip this coffee and be, just be still and appreciate this moment that you, you created this moment to exist because you created this moment to exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and don't give them this moment what it doesn't need. It needs you and you need it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, as difficult it is, it's, it's a great thing to, to, to remind ourselves by and create a time to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing at the same time because I know you, you deal with a lot of people that have got a goal uh, and their goal is to, in, in the case of The Biggest Loser that you've done for quite some time now, it's a, it's a goal to, to lose weight. So how do you work with clients where you, you've, you're balancing that? Look, you're in the moment. Yes, you, you, you aren't where you want to be. For the entrepreneur, it's like, yes, you've, you've not got the business where you want to be. For the celebrities that you train, it's like, yeah, you're not quite ready for that movie or whatever. But it's, it's also getting that clarity of vision to say, well, when I wake up, I'm, I'm not where I need to be, but this is what I need to do to, to work, to, to move there. How, how, do, how do you kind of like get, get a good balance between those two things? The balance between where you don't, where you are and where you want to be? Yeah. So we, we were just talking about, look, you know, that appreciation of you're in a beautiful place, you're on the boat. I, it, it, yeah. It's difficult not to be happy, even though we, we're not necessarily happy. But the person who's like, look, I'm, I, I'm not proud of my body. I'm not, sure. I, I don't want to be here. I've let myself go. I want something better. Did, 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 how, how do you balance that? Look, you know, you still, there's still a reason to be grateful about sure. this moment, but question. don't take your eye off, you know, where we want to help you go together. I think everything deserves this time, right? In essence, that's what I'm saying. Everything deserves this time. I would need you to allocate an hour, an hour and a half of working out, of taking care of your vessel and be present right now for that. I need you to take a moment and allocate uh, your mindset and meditate and relax and listen to some good music, find a good reason to laugh, watch a good movie, allocate time for that, right? I need you to allocate some time for work and focus. So sometimes things overlap, but I think at the core of you, the true, and this is a practice, by the way, I'm not saying this is super easy, but I'm saying it's a practice. If the core of you comes from a place of appreciation and gratitude and value, you're gonna appreciate, okay, guess what? I'm overweight right now, but I know that my body can be better. I know that I'm capable. So I'm gonna give time towards making that, achieving that goal. If we are in high school, we're not going to fast forward our thoughts to married and kids and career, right? We go from high school because we gave high school its time. And then we go to college and we give college its time. We leave college and we have that very first job that a career is now beginning and we focus and give it this, that time. So that practice in life teaches us to give every category of our lives the time that it deserves and give yourself some grace. Know that where you are isn't who you are, but you're working on a version. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. Have you found that there's been some almost like a successful way of people to accomplish, to, well, I guess to create a goal and we you know we're talking about i suppose people's physical ones but it can i'm sure it can apply to other areas of life but but to to, to go about 
envisioning or creating or imagining the goal and then the the effectiveness of of being able to stay focused because with you know let's face it i think we all know we're in an industry where most people start many weight loss journeys and they give in after a short space of time and then they're on to the next thing and whether it's buying equipment whether it's going to a gym whether it's working with a trainer that the failure rate is extremely high so have you seen anything in your career or experience where this is a good way to set and move towards those goals in terms of a strategy? A hundred percent, you know, visual cues are extremely helpful. You know, people have their vision board. People have, I have a client who puts post-its all around his house. It looks like an office that blew up something, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, those visual cues are important. I used to give this advice back in the day when I would be interviewed and I was helping the people on, on the biggest loser specifically and people that ask for advice about things like this. I would say to them, you remember those big staples or Home Depot calendars that are just huge, right? And it has the big the dates on it. Put something like that on your wall or better yet on your fr- on your refrigerator, right? And on days that you have amazing days, like you are just killing, you got a chance to work out, you're eating right, you woke up feeling great, you did all your supplements, your vitamins, you did all the things that you did to make you feel, oh, what a good day. You may even got a raise that day. I don't know. Life is good. You put a green line through that day, just a green marker. Boop. On days are just the opposite. Stress, didn't get a workout, didn't eat right, you overate, you ate super late, you got into an argument with the person you care about most, blah, 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 all the things. Put a red line in that day. In one month, how many red lines do you have? How many green lines do you have? Your goal the next month is to make sure the green outweighs the red. So now you have those visual cues to say, oh, crap. And by the way, purposely put them in the refrigerator because the moment you go to the fridge and make a bad decision, <laughs> the likelihood of it being green is going to help you out. So it's just little things like that that are super helpful. I like there was a story that you spoke about. I'm not sure whether it was about your son. I think it was something to do with children where you said you had a friend or they had a friend at school where their father came home. When I, when I heard you talking about this, it kind of made mm-hmm. me think, oh, you know, that, that's not something I could imagine saying to my children and it was, and it was a case of the father, you know, the children came home and the father said to them, what have you, what, what have you failed at today? And, and when you was telling it to me, I was kind of thinking, wait, where are you going to go with that? But as you expanded it, I thought, well, that's an interesting way of looking at things because, um, you know, you kind of look at your successes and we celebrate those. And I guess that's good because it makes you feel good. But how, is that something that you've adopted and, and how do you kind of make that work? effectively without necessarily dwelling on on your failures as well you know there's always a mr miyagi way of doing things right you go (laughs) you ask the right question the wrong way to help someone really think the depth of it um and make it their own my good friend sarah blakely who started spanx um she said once in an interview just that thing her father would her and her brother would come home and ask her they would just come home excited we did this we did this he said okay 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 what did you fail at today? What do you mean, what did I fail? What did, where did you try to do something and you didn't do good? He said, listen, kids, I don't care so much about what you were good. I mean, I care about those things. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm your father, I love you. But I wanna know, what did you try to do that you know you're not good at, but you gave it a shot anyway? Let's talk about that. That stood out to me. I think of all the interviews, I think I read it in an article or something, I was on a plane, and I'm fortunate enough for her to be a friend of mine. That stood out to me in a big way because you sort of reverse engineer that, how do you how do you keep going? How do you mm-hmm. lean into your weaknesses and make them your strengths is what that mm-hmm. is, right? Because we all have weaknesses. Some of them are underdeveloped. Some of us get to a point in our life where we pay attention to them enough to develop them. And I think that's what he was trying to get them habitually to get to, right? Mm-hmm. Make it a habit to whatever areas you may not be best in, at least you give it a shot to try to go for it. That doesn't mean everyone gets a trophy. That doesn't mean, right? It doesn't mean everyone's gonna be great at a thing, but at least you try to improve yourself. And to me, that was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that a go on my children. Actually, I'm always good luck. Always <laughs> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> this, this, this being a dad thing, man, is it's, it's, it's not easy. No, <laughs> my son's much older than yours. Yeah, and and that was that was something I was gonna 
I was going to talk about actually. I, I know you know your upbringing was you know it's probably not well. It's probably sort of different than I'm sure and what you have with your son. Yeah. But I, I was just interested to know in terms of relationships. Again, it's another thing that I think you've spoken about a number. You know, there's there's many different relationships that I think go into um, in, into your health. What's been your experience with relationships and I, and I suppose how has that got you to think about the importance of those as it relates to good mental and physical health? Um, the importance of my relationship currently or just various relationships? Ask me yeah, again. Yeah, so just just various relationships. So I suppose in, in in you know you've had and we can we can go into it, but from what I understand, you you know you had a you had a, um, an interesting yeah. up, upbringing. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of sort of men, mentally mm -hmm. um, abusive, ab abusive, and um, but it's something that you forget you f forgave. Um, and, and my guess is it had quite an impact on, on your life and, and how you look at relationships probably with other people. My guess is it's got something to do with, with some, of the, some of the impact that you're having on other people's lives as well. So I was, I was just wondering, like, I guess you can have good relationships. You can, uh, um, you can have people around you if you're trying to lose weight. You can have people mm -hmm. around you if you're trying to make money. But, but what, what's, what's the role of relationships in, in your life? And, and what are some of the, I guess, key lessons that you've learned about um, managing all of those different types of relationships, some we can change and some that we can't? Um, I think you, you, you probably summed it up towards the end. There's some you can change and there's some you cannot. I, I used to think that if I put my best foot forward, everyone would see me for who I am, the kind-hearted, funny, hilarious person that in my head that I am. But sometimes that doesn't mean that everyone will see that. And that's okay. I used to try to be in a room and prove myself. And you get to a point where it's not about me looking to change other people. I can only control me. And my change comes within me. Um, you know, and when it comes to parents, parents just don't have the answers just because they have the title. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, and, and it's really up to you to grow and learn because we learn two ways, by good examples and bad examples. So we have to make a decision on what's going to define me. Do I choose to lean into the good example and learn from the bad? Or do I tend to lean into the bad example and then see what happens with the good? So, it, it, you know, your parents teach you who to be or who not to be based on their behavior. Right. I made a decision not to be like my father, who wasn't very he wasn't a great communicator. It was his way or no way, uh, abusive mentally and physically. And I said, I'd never be that way with my son. I'm going to talk to him about everything. We're going to speak about everything. We're going to do everything. And that's cultivated in a good way, in a great way. But unfortunately, there's also a part of me that was very fortunate that my father was as stern as he was you know, militant in many ways, because it gave me not just a backbone, but it gave me responsibility and priority and agenda and and um, integrity, right? So it's like, there, there's all these various things. Um, there's something that I heard most recently about a, a an example of, of, a, of a, a family. And there was a father who was an alcoholic and he had two sons. And a reporter came and interviewed, well, I'll say it differently, a podcaster came <laughs> and mm -hmm. he interviewed the two got the two brothers. And and the the podcaster said to one brother who was an alcoholic, why are you an alcoholic? He said, because my dad was an alcoholic. The other brother, who was a multimillionaire, said, Why are you a multimillionaire? He said, because my dad was an alcoholic. Same dad, mm -hmm. same story, two different ways of motivation. So how does forgiveness play into that? Because my guess is, and I, I don't know about your story, I've only read and I, I can kind of imagine what it must have been like. And I can also imagine how difficult it must have been for someone to have actually, I suppose, um, stood up for themselves in a way where it's, look, I'm not going to let this define me. 
Um, and, but I'll also, I'm not going to let this be um, a weight around my neck that I'm going to carry around with me for a life. You, you know, it's, it, it, from what I read is you, you forgave your father for it and, and moved on. So how important, and I guess we've all got these situations in some time, whether it's parents or whatever, it could be a relationship. I guess there's all these situations where you could say, look, you know, you're the reason or this situation is the reason why I am where I am now. Yeah. And, and you use that, but, but that's not kind of defined you. So what, 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 is there any lessons in there? Was, was, was that intentional? Is, is that beneficial to, to have that approach? You know, what, what, what's, you know, what's the lesson from that? Would you say? I, I, I don't know that it was intentional as much. It was, I was extremely fortunate. I remember seeing someone who was I was deathly afraid of and asking permission to do something that I know I was going to get a no on. I know he was going to say no, but I built the courage to ask anyway. And when I saw him say yes and he softened, I did something I never did before. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little boy. I reached my arms around him and I hugged him. And I felt this energy of this sternness. My, you know, It just softened. And I literally felt him deflate in my arms. I never felt more powerful than that moment. That moment said to me, you know, if you lead with love, you'll probably land on exactly where you want to get as opposed to hiding or being afraid or being fearful. If I didn't forgive him, I'd be looking for every person that came into my life to help me forgive or teach me forgiveness. I'd blame them for their actions because I haven't forgiven the weight of um, um, suffering or pain or, you know, the more you know something, it's what you live in. So I know pain and suffering and fear and doubt. If I know all those things oh so well, I'm constantly looking through that lens or searching for it or be making sure that the person that's in my life is their responsibility now to help me get rid of it. There was a psychological study that said, we marry the person, the parent that hurt us the most. That, that work isn't done. <laughs> that work isn't done. So we are attracted to uh, uh, the emptiness in a way, right? Like help me feel this part of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. True, and that can be argued either way. But one thing I know about forgiveness is that it frees me and the other person, but mostly me because whatever burdens or issues that they have, they've put it on my energy, on my spirit. I have a choice. Do I let it live, let it fester and grow, or do I truly just let it go? And if I let it go, that means I see the act, but I've forgiven the person. Thank you for that. Thank you for that lesson. Let's both move on because you're more than what you're doing. And I realize that if I don't get to that place, I'll always carry their pain and it'll weigh us both down. In a lot of your work, you, you do put a lot of weight on the mental part of physical health and weight loss. Do you think that sometimes these kind of relationship or emotional issues are, are things that impact people's success at, at losing weight for example do you, do you think some sometimes that you know maybe that in your case you know that that relationship with your parents could be the thing that kind of keeps you away from from getting to where you want to be you know somehow it's it's kind of this this blockage in in in, in some respect there's more weight on the brain matthew than there is on the body there's more weight on the brain than there'll ever be on the body my perception my belief creates my habits. I eat a certain way. Once I get to a certain weight, I'm like, well, I might as well just keep eating. I might as well keep abusing. I might as well keep suffering. Again, it goes back to value. Someone who valued themselves would never say things like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you graduate from that? I don't know. I, I believe you can. I believe we all have the ability to be better than where we are. It's waking up and making a decision. Again, down in Miami, speaking to a large group, I met a woman who said, you know, during COVID, I helped myself lose 90 pounds. I bought a Peloton bike. I got on that thing, Nortec, Nortec, whatever she did on a Nortec, Nortec, Nortec track bike or whatever she used. And I said, you did this by yourself? She said, yes. Scared, but I did it. There's a certain willpower that's in each and every one of us, you know? 
certain people applied in other areas in their lives. I'm about to meet a friend of mine right now who happens to be my client who's in town and he's overweight and he knows it. He's a very successful businessman. Was, he owned gyms at one point in his life. But it's his weight that is. So I say to him, the discipline that you apply into your work and into your family, you need to turn that discipline into yourself. You have the discipline in you, but you're, you're choosing to direct it only one way, right? Yeah, we A lot of times we go toward what feels easy. I'm gonna keep steering my boat into the sun. Meanwhile, the lesson is in the storm. You better start steering towards something you're, you don't like doing. Because guess what? The actual place that you will land to is beyond that storm. Or you can just coast and just, you know, the other way. But you're not gonna graduate on this side. You're not gonna be better until you start to challenge yourself to be better, not to be what comes easy, not to be what you've practiced 10, 20 years in doing and you know you're good at it, but what am I not good at? Hence the mm -hmm. question again. <laughs> Let me go into this storm and figure that out. That's how you grow. Do you think also there's a requirement to, to try and rebuild or, or, actually, or even start to build a relationship with yourself in the same way as you would do with another person? So to understand yourself, understand, yeah, I know it sounds kind of very crazy, well, but I, <laughs> I get it 100%. You, you know, what's so funny. It's funny you ask that question because we spend so much time telling other people what they should be doing. We have all the advice in the world. You want to make more money? Do this. You want to be an Instagram influencer? Do this. You want to have a body like this? Do this. But we don't do anything to develop ourselves because we're always using that sunny coast example, right? The example of, I know this, so let me tell you what to do. But what about the things you don't know? Are you working on that? There, there's a responsibility in each of us to self-develop. There's a responsibility in each of us to get better than where we are. Not coast in the life of what you are and who you are, but get, it was one of the most amazing things that happened during the pandemic where people got out of their routines forcefully and they were forced to do things they didn't want to do or ignored how to do. Two things happened. People got closer, people divorced. <laughs> <laughs> there were higher percentages on both sides because we're in the business of avoidance. We'll avoid like crazy with the, with the idea, I'm taking care of the house, said the man. I'm paying the bills, I'm getting us the business, I'm taking care, I'm the reason. But when that stops and that well is sh twisted shut, you now have all the water going in an entirely different valve, a whole different flow. Now you have to pay attention to things you've been ignoring. And what came out of that was a lot of self-development. What came out of that was self-awareness. There are areas in me, I have been unkind to my spirit. And because of that, maybe unkind to others. I put so much weight into things, I forgot how to be a person. I put so much, it's like someone who always texts but won't pick up a phone. I can't hear your tone and who you are because you're communicating only one way. We have to change that narrative. We have to change the way we communicate with ourselves in a lot of ways in other areas as we communicate with others. Do you think that the some of the social relationships you have for people uh, if it's not the right one can actually prevent a lot of people getting to where they want to be like you you're obviously probably able to be strong and you had a reason to to kind of break away from what was being told to you that wasn't serving you but do, do you think for a lot of people that can actually be quite difficult and and the only way really to to do anything about it is to actually search out a different support group or, or social relationships that that are more likely to to assist you to to get where you are I'll, I'll use an example like the biggest loser coming back to that again there's 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 quite it sounds like there's an environment which is is helpful to people when they're on the show there's a support structure there's um whereas you know when you're on your own you, you haven't got that and so so does that support structure make a big difference to people um that, that want to get somewhere would you say 
something I'm writing, almost finished now, writing in my second book, which is the same title of my podcast, Work Out the Doubt. One of the categories I speak on is social health. Who you associate with um, can truly determine whether you build or you bury, whether you grow or you go slow down, right? I think those things are super important. Association should be elevation, right? So that said, yes, 100%. You know, if all I did my entire life was surround myself with offense to my career and my choices with personal trainers, I think, act, speak, only personal training. But because in the core of me, I'm an entrepreneur, I put myself in very uncomfortable rooms for myself. I'm around tech guys and VCs and, and investors and hedge fund. I don't know what the hell y'all talking about <laughs> until I do. But I purposely put myself in an environment to learn and to grow and to expand. And who I associate with, you know, I, a friend of mine, we, we were talking about how tough living here in Los Angeles could be and how the vibe much different than most places, you know, it's just in Miami, like I keep saying, and energetically it's like, hey, how you doing here? People tend to just sort of, I remember walking down the street, walking my dogs, and this lady literally made it a point not to get eye contact with me and literally <laughs> just walk over here and just mind her own business. And I'm like, I'm not gonna bite you. And so me being me, hi, how are you? Nice to see you today, hope you have a good day. Just to say it's okay to be polite, right? Because people tend to wanna just go. But I feel this, to answer your question, we attract who we are, no matter where we are. Mm. If I'm insecure, I'm gonna attract insecure people. If I'm grounded and I'm driven and I'm ambitious, I'm gonna attract those people. Now it takes some sifting. I'm not saying it's instant. I'm not saying it happens overnight. It took me about a year, year and a half to, find a, to sort of tr find people that were genuine that had some stock to them, didn't have an agenda, weren't looking for me to pull them where I was without, they were more taking than giving. It's very hard to find givers who, if you're a giver, it's so easy to find takers. So it has everything, Matthew, to do with it. You know, that social health piece, who you rock with, if they're, if they're in a good place and you're learning how to get there, lean into that relationship, make that your circle, you know? It's something that probably isn't really recognized either. When you look at, whether it, again, business goal or weight loss goal, there's a number of things that you put on there. But searching out a the right kind of support group is not one of those things that you would even probably put as a goal. But I, I suppose when, when you look at the weighting of it and, and, and I suppose the power of those right groups, it, it's probably something after listening to you and also having my own personal experience, it's probably something that you've got to work, is worth working extremely hard at, even though you may not necessarily find that group straight off. Would, would, would you agree with that? 1000%. Guess what? You're not going to get it right the first time. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to find people that are disingenuous. You're going to find people that have agendas. You're going to go into a room thinking, I'm here to find a friend and everything I, everyone I chat with is going to be just like me. You might meet someone who's disguised that way. Meanwhile, their agenda is just to see how you can help them or take from you or kind of figure out who you are, right? And bring nothing to the relationship. You have to be mindful of that. You have to make sure that you have enough stock or, or, or uh, foundation is solid enough not to continue to fall down with no grounding. You know, growing up for me, the way I grew up and having, you know, some strong women in my life uh, you could always fall back on mama. Mama was great grandma because she, you know, she was the, the matriarch, you know, no matter what was going on, you go say, mama, what's this? Well, baby. And she would give you the most profound advice, but it gave you something solid and strong to hold on to. I always say, make sure you have someone in your life that's in your inner circle, 10 to 15 years older than you, that is grounded, that is experienced, that is ambitious who's lived a life way before you, make sure that they are part of your, your circle, your conciliary, your, your, your night round table, if you will. Because if you have that, no matter what kind of things wave, you have some sort of solid foundation or guidance because we all need that in our lives. Mm. Would you also advise kind of being aware of those things that, that 
don't do that and trying to, I suppose it's like um, having too many drinks. You want to kind of limit <laughs> the amount of bad stuff you put into you. <laughs> 100%. You know, everyone's personality is a little different. Everyone sort of um, sometimes gives away too much and also expects too much, you know. Um, be aware, right? Listen for cues. You know, if you find that you have someone in your life who always complains about everyone else, of course they're going to complain about you. <laughs> but you're not exempt. Don't think for a second if they're talking shit about everyone else that they're not going to say anything about. They're 100. This is their nature. So be mindful of who you give your things away to. Right? Be just be just listen more than you speak. And when you speak, make sure you're speaking to the right people. It, yeah, and I don't know what that is. I don't know what the right people are for you. Only you know that. Experience is going to give you more than I ever will. So your your podcast, your new podcast is is called Work Out the Doubt. Yeah. Is is that word doubt something that you have played around with personally for quite some time, which is why you decided to name your podcast out of it? Yeah, I've worked. I've I've helped others work out the doubt. Others have helped me. I've played with doubt in my life. I still play with it a little bit like putty in my hand. I Sometimes it sticks. Sometimes I roll it up and throw it away. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant exercise, if you will. Um, and I think we all do. I don't think anyone is exempt. You know, when something is new and foreign, there's fear there. You know what I mean? Um, you want to bungee jump. Your doubt is, am I going to land on that ground? Or will this thing that's on my feet plunge me up? But you do it. And you tackle the fear and thank God you did it. And it's a, something else that you've done. My son just uh, went uh, skydiving. He said, I peed the whole way down, but I landed. You know what I mean? And we have to sort of get to a place where we want to challenge ourselves enough to be better. And that's what to me work out the doubt is. I, I found in my work that anyone, I had my private studios in Atlanta and I did all the consultations. And when people came to visit before I trained them myself or dispersed them to the trainers, my trainers that worked for me, I had to figure out, A, who would have been best for this person. But every consultation, there was doubt and fear attached to it to some degree. For some people, it was physical. For some people, it was mental, emotional, spiritual. Whatever the doubts might be lingering, we all have them and we've had them. So I knew a long time ago, early in my career, I got to help people work out up here, here, and then the body. I'm going to do a mixture of it. I'm going to weave it all together at some point, but I always start with the perception. What have you found has triggered doubt in you? And what have you found personally has been a successful way of overcoming that doubt and moving towards where you want to go? Um, I think something that triggers doubt for me is proving myself, especially to people that I think should automatically know who I am, right? If I ever get in a disagreement with someone close to me and I, I'll, I'm easily offended if they're like, well, you shouldn't have did that. You know I would never do that because you're supposed to know me. And so the weight of that sometimes is a, is a trigger for me. Um, and maybe there are times as I think on it uh, that I've gone in for an audition for a job or just a regular interview if you will um and having the the confidence to present my best self and not think so much on what i should do but be ex uh, but be exactly who i am um i've, I've worked on that again with that the, those five g's that i said about you know waking up with gratitude asking for guidance, grazing, going, and giving, I, I came up with these five G's that sort of helped me navigate my day and that are tangible because each finger, once closed, make an impact. And those are some of the tools that I personally use and I speak about um, oftentimes. Hmm. Have you found, you've, you've worked with a lot of huge celebrities. I know probably the biggest name that people don't understand around the world where they're listening to this is Justin Bieber, I believe. Have you, um, have you 
when you've been working with these people, my guess is that you've got to know them and you've got to understand their mindset. And, and they, you know, they're, however you look at it, they're pretty unique individuals to have, have reached that level of success, whether you agree with the, the type of success or not, they're pretty unique individuals. So what have you learned from watching and, and being in contact with people that have been extremely successful in certain areas as it relates to people trying to go after and be successful in whatever success means for them personally? There's actually more similar similarities than differences. The struggles are similar. The differences might be a relentless um, ability to keep going. You know, when you're dealing with someone who is looked at, sought after, uh, adored, they tend to put more pressure on the expectations of execution than someone who doesn't have those things. There, there's no camera on them. You know, we tend to light up when we know that we're adored. We tend to execute better or hopefully better. In certain, certain cases, we, it takes us a long time to land there, but we eventually land there. Um, the similarities are just that, though. They want to be better. I don't care who you are, famous or not, free or not. I think we all wake up with the intention, I want to have a better day today. And that's the most common thing. Mm. In working with the, the, the rich and famous, how important is health, or again, your definition of health and wellness in their success? What part does that play, if, if anything, <laughs> would you say? Is everything, you know, we want to sustain, you know, how many of our celebrities have gone or have passed us? You know, you look at someone like Robin Williams, he made the world laugh while he was sad the whole time. <laughs> you know, if he was healthy mentally, he wouldn't have taken his own life. You know, you can think of so many other celebrities like that example. There's also a component, though, that people get to a stage in life like, okay, I have all these things, no matter where I go, I'm adoring. People actually give me things. I already have things, but I'm given things. But the one thing I don't have is how much I love myself or, you know, because I've been distracted so much by the objects I have, uh, you know, it, it objectifies me. Anyway, that mirror is a bitch. The fame is a crutch in certain cases. Um, and one thing I've learned more than anything is that celebrities are still human beings and they appreciate more than anything to be treated as such. Um, but the health component is key. I'm working with starting this week, actually, with someone who is infamous and he will he still has struggles. He's still going through things. Right. And my job is to help not just navigate those struggles, but constantly bring him back to the sun, back to the sun, right? Stay bright, stay light, stay bright, stay light. And if I can do that, I'm doing my job. That means, listen, you're going to take not only your focus shouldn't be so much of taking care of everyone. If you're not full, let's focus on taking care of you that when you do take care of everyone and he does, it becomes natural and easy. It's not, it's not work anymore. It's, it's just smooth. And that's what I want to create for him. You've used a, a statement, and I'm, I'm, I may have got it a little bit wrong, but the essence is, is correct. Is You said something along the lines of change your habits um, and your mind follows. So if we, if we take exercise for, a, for an example, where you, and you gave an interesting example of Rob, Robin Williams, uh, where he was clearly not, not happy, even though he's making everyone else laugh. How, how do you... Um, how do you see exercise in that as it relates to that statement? Is it a case of, look, your mind might, might not be there, but just get out, go for a walk, and, and your mind's going to sort of follow this? Is, is, it does, does the exercise in terms of, you obviously, your mind's obviously got to be engaged to do that, but is, is it a case of trying to get that movement to assist with your mental health? Is, is that the sort of the trigger in some cases, would you say? 1,000%. Listen, the magic is in the movement. If you start in your body, guess what happens? You move your mind. You start to flow. You start to think clearer. But if I'm, the, the curtains are down. Uh, I'm in a dark room. I'm in my slump. I'm watching mindless TV. I'm not moving. I'm sitting down. What's going to happen? Misery loves company. I'm going to go to the hat cabinet. I'm going to grab some marshmallows and some chocolate. And I'm going to make my own little s'mores in each hand like a dodo bird. Right? If I do that, 
then I'm just weighted down. But what if I opened up the blinds and that light hit me, right? There's a scientific correlation between the neurons in our minds or, or, or the cells in our minds appreciating light in such a way that it gives those photo, photo um, neurons, uh, give us that energetic, ah, oh, that pop, if you will, right? Just by the light alone entering our, our pupils, that lighting up your mind. That same energy is applied when you move. I remember my first season on The Biggest Loser, you know, and you have these contestants who are so worried about the camera being on them that they don't want to say certain things. They feel like if they say it, then the people at home that may have been their um, crutches would be offended. And once it got aired, they would offend someone, right? So they didn't do or say certain things that I know they needed to say in order to get past that threshold that got them here in the first place. But then when I tell them to raise it to treadmill to 10, and then when I tell them to take the speed from 3.0 to 5.8, when I tell them to go sprint for 30 seconds on an incline and they do it, something happens physically where they're so empowered the emotion that they've been struggling with surfaces. But it took that physical push in order for the emotional explosion to happen. Had that not happened, they would have practiced what they've been practicing and closing it up and hiding behind it, putting it behind their heart instead of bringing it to the front. But sometimes you got to move against inside to make the emotions come outside. It's, it, it, it works every time. So what have you found as, as being some recently su successful habits that you've built into your life to help you to get where you want to go? That's, that's a beautiful question. Um, I learned, I learned something very key last year, you know, um, something happened to me when I, when I moved out here to Los Angeles. I was always in charge my entire life, like right? meaning that I I paid the bills, I made the money, I took care of the workers, I took care, I mean, my employees, my friends, my staff, my family. Um, then I came to Los Angeles and I had to answer to a manager, a publicist, lawyers. But one day, Biggest Loser ended. And when it ended, I'm like, now what do I do? Right? How do I, I have no that's 90% of my income. <laughs> like, what do I do now? I got to make my way back into me. And I realized something that I was only as successful based on going back to basis, which was I'm a professional giver. During the pandemic, for 96 days straight, I turned on my Instagram live and I just talked to people. And then talking to them became working them out. Couldn't tell who was watching me. I was just there moving. Right. For some, they're like, yeah, so you did like a YouTube channel. But well, you got to keep in mind, I've never done that. I'm, I'm old school. I always have someone in front of me. I'm helping them. They're helping me. I never just moved for the sake of moving. And going back to that last question, because I started moving, first was the exercise, then was the movement. I mean, uh, the, the motivation or the, or the words, because I did that for 30 minutes. And the next 30 minutes, I sat right here and I said, OK, person, tell me your story, who you are. what you? And we started solving problems. And I gave people something to look forward to, right? Five, four, five days a week, first the movement, then the message. On the Saturday, I did a meditation that was guided. And on Sunday, I did a talent show. Matthew, that was the best thing that could have happened to me in a, in a time that we were all depressed with no sense of purpose, with nothing to do. I said, I got to give myself away. I got I to gotta lend time. Even if it's just an hour or two, I'm going to put myself on a schedule. It was the best thing that happened to me because it gave me a sense of purpose and every and anybody who came on. And then from that, business started pouring in. That's a great story. And I think it's one that many of us have had to deal with as a result of a pandemic where you suddenly find yourself in a place and you don't know where you, you didn't think you would be where you are and, and you've got to dig yourself out of a hole or well, not necessarily a hole but you've got to kind of reinvent yourself and and mm -hmm. i suppose inspire or be inspired to go after something um and i think it's a shame that i, I met i went to a, a show a few weeks ago a big fitness show in in dallas and a lot of kind of ex-colleagues that have that have either exited the business or decided it's not for them and just sort of given up really 
which is which is a real shame because these are very very smart people that I, I feel had so much more to give. But um, you know, the, the, up up here they they decided that it was over. Which we we yeah. we, we, cr we create these crutches, right? We create a crutch that we go from doing to waiting, <laughs> right? If I tell everyone you can't do that anymore, there's 80% of people that say, okay, and they just stop. And then they start waiting to see what's gonna happen next. The best thing you can do, and this is a big learning thing because again, I'm a capitalist. I love to, you know what I mean? I love to grow. I love to look at nothing and create into something. The best thing that I did and the biggest learning thing for me, just do it, just do it for the sake of doing it. Do something. That's something that I knew for the longest time, right? Maybe during the pandemic, all of us were became overweight and obese, right? Mentally and emotionally. But what do I say to people that are overweight and obese? Just do it, do something, start moving. And moving means just giving something to yourself and others. And that's what I did. I just started moving. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna do something or I'm gonna do nothing. And what happens when we do nothing? Nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. That's the simplest answer, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. So, well, look, I've I've got a I've, we've we've gone on for a while. I have got one more question, Dolbert. But okay. before before I ask that, I just want to um, for people who want to find out more about you, listen to your guided meditations, maybe check out your podcast. Where where can they go? Uh, my podcast is Work Out the Doubt, and they can find it on all streaming networks um, where podcasts are streamed, be it iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Work Out the Doubt. And I appreciate the love. Excellent. Um, and so final question, Dolvet. Escape mm. Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a more recent and memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? Boy, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that I've escaped my limits um i finally did what you're doing now you know <laughs> i always have these ideas or have i told you it's like a three year in the work making thing to have a podcast but i i i'm very fortunate to have an amazing team that's helped me i know what i'm good at i'm good at this part my team is good at all the other behind the scenes things and i'm grateful to god for that like i finally am having conversations that are enriching I'm finally giving and I'm also getting. So that would be mine. That would be yours. And I've I've been I've been doing it for four years and I'm still Oof. a student. Um so it's 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 gone I bow quickly. Down. And I bow every down day I'm every day I'm, well I I I think you're wonderful. You're you're a natural, so I've been I've been watching yours. But someone asked me this question and I I I I'd be interested to know what you think. Is is what so you know in four years time when yours is your show's a big success what what are you what what's going to be the big sort of big reason that that you're going to have continued to to put in the work for that period of time what 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 what's the sort of personal payoff for you um i'm a I, i'm the person who always wants to go on vacation in, in someone else's life or their mind rather right i i don't i don't i'm not matthew j i'm not but having a conversation with you and hearing your story I can I can go on that vacation even for a moment, and I love that. I love the exploration of stories. I love the similarities, and there's certain shit I'd never do. So my juice is living that with you, along with you, and and learning from all that. You know, it's uh, there's so many corners of this world I have yet to see. There's so many flowers I have yet to smell. That's corny, though, right? But the truth is, um, I want to, and I know as long as I stay curious, I'll always want to explore. And I'll have all of those things one day. Fantastic. Well, Dolvit, thanks for your time. There's been some great nuggets in there. Thank you, brother. I look forward to seeing you in, in real life one day. Thank you very much. As well. Thank you, Matthew. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.